challenge of uh, of bringing the introducing the gospel to the former Soviet Union after the wall came down. So uh, you have been in the Ukraine actually longer than I've been there. I've been in the Ukraine for about 11 years now, but you've been there for about 12 years or something, or 13 years, since 89. I went there in 93. And uh, you, have ch- you have rock churches now all over the Ukraine. And, uh, and what has surprised me with Bishop uh, Bortiz is, be- is that uh, when most people came in because it was so easy to raise money and to convince people to go and uh, uh, minister in Russia after the wars came down, that now, because uh, now it's like, that's not the news any longer. So, uh, but... Bishop is not backing out. He's, he's sticking in, I mean, he's talking with the people. And he's coming back every year, every year, every year to help the church. It's not just his church, but the churches and uh, to work with all of that churches and to do things all over the country. And to go, not just go to the big churches, but to go to remote places when it comes. This is an example. It's unbelievable. This nation needs to learn from that. I mean, you're going all over the country, all over the countries of the world, in fact. So I'm so challenged by that. And I, and I want to say, yeah, a big thank you to you to, for releasing your pastor to do all that. We, now, yeah. <laughs> now, we, we, I begin to know what that means now that I, I need to leave my church so often. And, <laughs> and I see the response and the faces of my people. They know it. It needs to be done, but they are not always happy to let their pastor go. So now <laughs> I know what it means for you to be releasing your pastor, to have been releasing your pastor since 1989 uh, to come to Russia. And uh, well, we're going to have a wonderful time this week. Uh, today and tomorrow, we really look up to God to speak to us, to minister to us, and to uh, uh, touch us in a new way. So can we pray? Now, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your presence. Now, Spirit of the Lord, I pray that you will come evidently and make yourself manifested. Through your living word, you will quicken your people. I pray that the power of the Holy Ghost will come down and touch us where we most need you. Now, Spirit of God, Whatsoever might be the hard desires and the needs of your people tonight, to this morning, I pray that you will minister to us individually. I come against any pain, any sorrow, any troubles in the heart and the lives of people. I pray that you open their minds up to receive from you. I pray that you will minister to us individually, personally that we might feel the hand and the touch of our loving God. We pray that you will touch us and raise us, raise us to a new level that we had never experienced before. We pray that you will show us something deeper than the ordinary. We pray that you will not just bring us to an ordinary meeting this, this morning, but you will cause us to experience your touch. And for us to desire you more than anything we've ever experienced. Thank you for this church. Thank you for using her all over the world. Thank you for using the leadership of this church. Thank you for all the investments that they have uh, put in the kingdom of God, in the Ukraine and all over the countries of the world. I pray that you bless them. I pray that you protect the, the bishop when he's overseas right now. I pray that your hands will be upon him. I pray that you will use him to establish your kingdom like never before. I pray that you will bring him back safely. And I pray that everything that you're using him to give to other people, that you will return to this church in a wonderful way. In the name of Jesus, we appreciate you this morning. We thank you for your presence. We thank you that you are going to minister to us and you are going to cause us to hear from you. And as we hear from heaven, we will be transformed, we will be changed, and we will be the kind of people that will be relevant to bring a difference to our world. Thank you, Lord, for doing it. In Jesus' name. 
Amen. Well, I would like to pray for the person that is having uh, some troubles in your stomach. It's like you have a rupture, and it's a situation that could lead to hyena or some growth in the stomach. So if you, have, if you feel that you have some challenges in your stomach, please put your hand on yourself. God would like to heal you this morning. Please just touch yourself. In Jesus' name, we rebuke that condition. We command that, we command that pain to stop. And we, we, we pray for the healing touch of the Lord to come upon your body. In Jesus' name. If you are also experiencing some headache, will you please touch your head? And that headache is going to stop in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, we command the headache to stop. And we pray for refreshment into your, in, in your head, in your brain, and in your membranes. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for doing it. If you have some challenges with your blood cells, also God would like to touch you today. In Jesus' name. Father, we pray that you regulate that blood cells and you bring full healing to the body of your children today. Thank you, Lord, for doing it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, yeah, I see some... Uh, are you all Russians? Yeah, Ukrainians, Russians. You coming in from New York? From Dennis? Tennessee, Tennessee. Well, welcome. Let's welcome some of my... You are from Tennessee. What about the people back down there? From where? Pennsylvania. Let's welcome them. Pennsylvania. Grass with you. Spray them. Kakwashi Dela. Major Dojni Kakta admit it's why. Fuska Americans at the Peru J Club by it. That way it is stand. Fuska Vam at some that dude. Avasi. Let them stand. Let all the Russians here stand or Ukrainians and uh, are you glad to see some of my people here? <laughs> yeah. Spasiba, please. It's, it's exciting that when, wherever I go all over the world, I see some people get to know that Pastor Sunday is coming around <laughs> from all over the world, from Ukraine, Russia, from all over the former Soviet Union, and they just show up. I never even invited. I don't. I don't need to invite them. I don't even need to inform them. They get to know somehow. <laughs> it's just like what Ruth said: "Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God." And uh, it's interesting that uh, in some places, especially when I go to Europe, some European countries to speak. In fact, it happens that in some cases there's black African churches meeting in the same premises like let's say in the Netherlands, where the Dutch people are meeting. So I come to preach to the Dutch people, and uh, uh, the African people will not come to the service. But the Euro Euro Ukrainians, Russians, from other cities, we all come in. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like interesting. So who am I? So it's like I'm more Ukrainian. <laughs> people responding. Ukraine has responded to me, but the, I, more than I appeal to the black people. <laughs> Interesting. Well, that's what God could do with us when we really obey him and uh, try to please him in the way we can do. It will just uh, expand your borders and uh, give you a territory beyond, beyond your imagination. Amen. Well, maybe some of you would like to know my story. I was born in Nigeria. I, I, I saw a few Nigerians just when I was coming in. Are there more, more Nigerians here? Well, happy to see you all. And, uh, you know, Pastor uh, Bishop has been telling me a lot about Nigerians in his church. <laughs> it's like he's also in love with Africans. He's said from different countries in this church. And uh, so... I was born in Nigeria and uh, grew up till I was 19 years old there. And uh, I never knew, I was growing up in a village, and I, I never actually did 
hear anything about salvation till I was maybe 19 after my high school. So then uh, I was listening to a television program one night, and this man was preaching on, you know, Jesus. And I thought it was just because I was Anglican or what, Presbyterian, and I thought I was okay with the Lord. But when I heard him, uh, the Lord conv uh, convicted me, and uh, I gave my life at 19. And then six months later, I got a scholarship to go and study in Russia. So uh, I left my country, being in the Lord only for six months. And I went to Russia 18 years ago. That was during communism. And uh, it was not an easy experience. If you know what communism meant, I mean, my people here will know. That was <laughs> that's a whole hell of an experience. I don't pray that anybody will ever go through that experience again. Because at least for the Russians, it was good in the sense that at least they could uh, meet in the underground church among themselves. But we foreigners who came, they told us there were no Christians. Nobody saying hallelujah or amen. <laughs> that, uh, uh, no God. That this is an atheist country. And so they would not allow us to meet with the underground church. But we knew that there, there should be, you know, underground church or churches somewhere and there should be believers in the country, but they would not allow us to go meet them. So uh, uh, we needed to find for ourselves and survive anyhow you could. So in the process, about 90, I would say, between 90 to 99% of Christians who came to Russia ended up backsliding because few people could survive the, could survive the pressure. I mean, I, I, I didn't know too many people who survived it. So people ended up drinking, smoking, you know, having uh, immoral sexual life. And, but the Lord just held me up in a miraculous way. Not just me, but a few of us survived it. And uh, one of the guys that I came into the country with, who was a Christian, praying with me, was, we lived in the same room, he actually ended up dying alcoholic. By the time I went 11 years ago to Ukraine to plant a church, he was brought to my church as an alcoholic. And he was a born again Christian who were praying and uh, fasting together initially. But, you know, that, that, is, that is not a, a, a unique experience. It happened to most people. He died at maybe 36. And, uh, and his parents never really get to know that. Their, their son, who went there to study as a Christian, they thought he's still alive, actually, till now. They think he's abroad and they will still come back home sometime. But, uh, <clears throat> but you know, people start telling you the stories like, it's so cold here in Russia, minus a centigrade, I don't know what we call it in Fahrenheit, but like minus 25 degrees centigrade. And uh, that is, they say, okay, you, at le you, need, you will need at least a smoke to survive it. <laughs> or they tell you, you need vodka. You know, did you hear of vodka? You, you all know vodka? Yeah, you need to keep warm. And, uh, <laughs> and some people fall into that. And uh, that's the deception of the enemy. You know, yeah, but uh, the few people who survived it, God is now using them mightily all over the world. Uh, the largest churches in the former Soviet Union and indeed in the whole of Europe, are now being pastored by some of those people that went through communism, didn't bow to the system, and kept their faith, and were faithful to the law. Uh, actually, during my experience in, uh, in the Soviet Union, I thought three times, th at least minimum of three times, I thought I was going to uh, end up my life in a psychiatric or a mental hospital. Because I, I was thinking, because that was what happened to, okay, some of the people who did not backslide were sent back home because they saw them doing strange things, like if you're praying and you, you don't hide it, you don't pretend very well, they think you're sick, so they send them to the <laughs> mental hospital. <laughs> so I thought I, would be, I was going to be one of them, but God didn't allow that to happen. And, uh, and, uh, so, but three times I thought I, caught, I came very close. <laughs> 
But I told myself, I said, I will not compromise. And I will not trade my faith for sin or for the system. Come what may. I would rather die. I would rather go to the mental hospital. But then what also was very interesting was not most people who bowed did not bow because of the communists putting them in prison or torturing them, most foreigners. But they were actually bowing to the pressure of making money because foreigners could make money or because they wanted to you know, build houses back in Africa and you know, you know, just set up their bases. And, but doing it illegally, you know, making money uh, in an illicit way. But uh, then most of the other people, they, were, they, they fell from the Lord because of you know, some sins like, not because of pressure, not because communists wanted to kill them and they had to renounce their faith, but, but because, uh, because of sin. <laughs> I remember one of my friends uh, saying, well, I don't know if I will ever come back to Europe again, but this is an opportunity for me to have an experience with white ladies, and I'm going to try it out. <laughs> and these are supposed to be Christians. So you try it at one time, you never get out of it. And uh, so a lot of things like that. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is because when you are going through some trials, you, ne- you, you like kind of feel like you are, you are going to sink or you never get out of it, or there is no uh, light uh, after the, uh, at the end of the tunnel. But really, if you can stand it, if you can really pay the price, and just be faithful to the Lord in the darkest hour, you will not believe the kind of elevation, promotion, and uh, glory God is going to give you. He's going to honor you, and he's going to stand, stand by you in such a way that the people who were laughing at you before, they will now be envying you. Because that's exactly what I've experienced. In those days, when those people were having cars as students, they were having houses and having a lot of money, I was living like a poor student because of my determination not to compromise. I was, so I was not making money the way they were making money and uh, not doing a lot of things. And you would think you are silly because in a university of 15,000 people, maybe we had only three Christians, three or five Christians, 15,000 out of 15,000 students. So you don't really get to see them because they are also hiding. And when you try to talk to anybody about Christ, they say you are from the Stone Age. Oh, you are from Africa. Oh, now we understand. You don't have the technologies to prove there is no God. <laughs> you just laugh at you and, you know, the professors. And you have to give exams to prove there is no God. You know, there is something they call scientific atheism. And there is another one they used to call... Uh, Lenin and uh, Marxist philosophy. All those things are theories. You have to prove scientifically that there, there, there was no God. So it was so difficult to talk to people. I mean, for the first four years, I couldn't get any Russian saved. And I was trying my best. I could get some foreigners saved, but not Russians, because they'd be brainwashed. Nobody could even consider it that there was God. But then they will be convincing you and they will be proving it to you scientists. And you have to prove it. Give an ex- if you don't give that exam, it was so compulsory. And it, was, it was done in such a way, if you don't give that exam, you will not be able to get your diploma. You will not be able to get your... Uh, your you will never be able to give, give the main exam for your specialty. So if you don't pass the exam about communism and about atheism, you are not going further to become a doctor or a lawyer, whoever you wanted to become. They chase you from the university. So that was the point that I really st- I stood at a dilemma because I was saying, my, I, w- I will not prove there is no God. It's because many people at that stage were being removed from the university because they were Christian, they would not believe, I mean, they would not change their conviction. So God told me, no, I brought you here for a purpose, not just to get your profession, but to stay here. So, you know, if you don't give this exam, you will be excommunicated. You will not get your certificate. Then you will not fulfill the purpose that I brought you in here for. So I said, how do I do it? How should I prove to 
the world that uh, there is no God. Well, whereas I know you, I knew there was a God. I, I, I know you personally. Then God said, just take in everything they give you. You know, don't try to argue with them. Just learn it and study it. Uh, but never allow, never digest it. Never allow it to go into your system. <laughs> so take it in. Don't digest it. And during the examination, pour it out back to them. <laughs> that is exactly what I did. <laughs> and I got an excellent mark. <laughs> so some people were confu con confused, saying, what? You say you're a Christian, and you are always going with the professors. But now you got the exam, and you even got an excellent mark. <laughs> and, but thank God I did, because if I'd been stubborn or religious, like some of my people were very religious, so how can I? I would not. I would not compromise my faith. And, but God demands wisdom sometimes. You know, the, the, the survival strategy is called wisdom. So, <laughs> and okay, like people from Nigeria might be familiar with some with, with this term I'm going to use. There are some people. There were some people who came from Nigeria with me who are from very conservative churches, like Deeper Life. You know those kind. You know they were really strict. And I, was, I got saved there myself, but I was not there for too long. I was there only for six months, so I could change on the way. <laughs> so they were very stiff kind of Christians. Like they, they would not, you know, they would not even go for, they would not even consider any compromise. And in a system where you need to survive, you don't sin, you don't need to sin, but, uh, but like giving exams, if you don't give it, they just chase you from the university. But they will say, no, we are Christians. Like, we will die for God. Yeah, we too, but give, you know. So most of them were just chased from the university because of that. And many other instances. Many, okay, for example, the first time, because in Africa we have a kind of different culture. And in my university, we had people from 99 different countries. So, you know, in, international. So one time, I remember an experience I had. One time, uh, we, because of, I did well in the exams, and this lady got to know that we were the only two people who got the highest mark in the exam. So she came and hung on me, a white lady from Cyprus, a Greece. So she was kind of, you know, just rejoicing, just hello. And we don't practice that, and especially from the church I came from, we don't hug ladies. So... When I experienced that, then this is, I myself thought, oh my God, I'm backslidden. <laughs> that is what, that is the kind of thing religious can do for you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so that night I couldn't even pray. I went to bed not praying because I was afraid of approaching God. I thought I had sinned against him. <laughs> so the next morning God said, if you don't pray now, even if you feel you are guilty, confess it and go on. But if you don't do it now, if you don't reconcile with me now, you will never do because of guilt will be chasing you more. And that kind of thing, you know, I just made that as, a, as an example. Those kind of things were so many rampant. In the, you know, you needed to do some things that you are not so comfortable with or you would not have done it in your own normal kind of circumstance. So, but if because you couldn't compromise or you think you have failed God, or you have failed yourself, or because you have, you have sinned. So most of the people who fell from God started from that point. So, and because you have estranged yourself from God, the grace is no more there to protect you from the big sins. So those kind of things. So then people be just began falling off and uh, committing sin and all that. But God saw me through communism, and uh, uh, we survived it. Gorbachev. Maybe you, you people heard of Gorbachev? Gorbachev, yeah. Gorbachev, Mikhail Gorbachev. He was a good friend of uh, your deceased uh, late president, Reagan. Yeah, so they brought, he brought a new, uh, he brought just a new breath to the whole nation. He started communism, I mean, he started glasnost, he used to call it, and perestroika. So during that uh, new policies he brought, you know, this 
country started opening up. And I was a student in the university, so for the first time in the 90s, we got introduced to, actually 89, we started getting the freedom to meet with, with the Christians, the Russian indigenous Christians. So then we discovered that there were Baptists, Baptist people, they were evangel no, uh, uh, what do you call it? Pentecostals. They were Pentecostals. And uh, so we started meeting with them and having services together and all that. So then I finished my studies in journalism. I did my master's in uh, Ukraine, no, not Ukraine, Belarus, Minsk, Belarus. Then after I finished that, I went in 1993 to the Ukraine to work as a journalist. Uh, then we, before then, we had planted a few churches in Belarus before going to the Ukraine. And uh, in the Ukraine now, I thought, because the communists, even during Perestroika, Gorbachev's regime, well, I was preaching in one of the towns in Belarus, and the communists just rounded up, the KGB rounded us up with my group. And uh, they arrested me, so they chased me out of the country. <laughs> yeah. So that was 1992. You know, it, it was like things were changing, but not so fast. So people were still living in the same system. KGB was still, up to now, a lot of things, things still remain the same. So I had to leave Belarus because of that. I wanted to go back to Africa, but God said no. So he opened a door for me to go to the Ukraine. And I was, because I was a journalist, so I, I, was, I just went there not as a pastor, but uh, as a journalist. And, uh, but, for, uh, but I couldn't work for, as a journalist for too long, because God brought me there not for journalism, actually. <laughs> he brought me for his purpose. So uh, then by 1994, I had to succumb to the leading of the Holy Spirit to uh, plant another church in the Ukraine. We planted that 10 years ago. Our church is now 10 years old. And the Lord has just been faithful. So that faithfulness that I showed to him during communism, when everybody was making me a laughing stock, and he shows me now that he who lives last, lives best. <laughs> yeah, so uh, now some of those guys who had everything that time, even before they get to me, they, 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 just to get to me now, they will need to at least uh, <laughs> make an appointment three months before. <laughs> and, uh, and they want to because uh, uh, things have changed. <laughs> Power has changed hands. <laughs> God didn't leave me where he found me. He took me to a new level and to a place where not only I never dreamt of it, but even they who were aspiring because they didn't want to lose it. You know, the principles of God remain the same. He that is willing to lose his life, he ends up keeping it. And you keep even more. And he that is unwilling to lose his life for Christ's sake, who, he that is uh, striving to keep his life, will never really get to enjoy life. So, but, and that is the problem that I've seen in the U.S. here. Most people, sorry to say, uh, are mostly trying to, they mostly try to make a living. Try to make a living. They are still concerned and consumed by the needs of life. But it's like we have not begun to believe the words of Jesus. What Jesus actually said is, do, don't worry about those things. Don't even be concerned about them. If you will make your priority, your life priority, the kingdom, seeking me, never seek things. Never chase after things. Never. Don't ever seek things or seek for things, for position, for glory, for, for recognition. For th never seek for things. That is a golden rule in the gospel of Jesus, if you read it properly. Say, but there is something that you must, seek about, you must seek after. Focus yourself, mobilize yourself, and begin to seek after the things of the kingdom. Seek to know me. Seek 
to discover the principles of my kingdom, if you seek the kingdom, it guarantees you that all other things shall be added to you. But we kind of seek after survival, life necessities. Okay, but that's why we go to job or every day. We never go to job late, or we, you know, but we, we don't joke with our jobs or with our uh, profession, or with our careers. But then we come to Sunday or to, on Wednesday night to church, just like <laughs> part of the deal. It's just like, it's a, you know, something you just do to, for God, you know. It's just a few, at least you give something to God. But the thing that we really seek after, where we really exert our effort and energy in is not in serving God, but in seeking after the old things. Then we just give a few part of our energy to God, but we think that's okay. But that is misplacing the, 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 the priorities. Well, the way God said we should do it is just the opposite. You could work, but that is just by the way. You could have career or profession, but that's just a means. But the thing that you are really doing is seeking after God and the profession, the job, and everything is just a means by which you, you know, you, you get a platform to, 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 to broadcast or to, 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 uh, to reveal the God that you serve, that you created you to serve him in the first place. Because when you are trying to make a living, you never get to leave. When you, because you are too busy trying to make a living, you see. You are too busy trying to get a living. You are, so you never really come to enjoy it. So when you are busy working, you never get to really enjoy the thing. You could acquire the things, but you never really get to know the taste and the beauty of life. But when you seek the kingdom, he said, I am the life. I am the life. I, I am the life. So you get the real life. And the intensity of life begins to flow from him in you to your outward surroundings. So if you see him and the kingdom, then you, you get a hold of life. And when you have life, you enjoy it already, even without the physical things. So that was the principle that I was trying to abide by during communism. So all other guys were trying to, they said, okay, let's make it first. <laughs> let's make money first. Let's, then when, when I have something, then I will, be able to be, I will be able to be comfortable enough to serve the Lord, or I will have time to serve God. But they have misplaced the priorities. And that's what people are busy doing. Okay, let me make money. Let me make, let me make it first. Then I will be able to serve God afterwards. But that is misplacing the priorities. So those guys who, who, who are doing well, they're still doing well. In but now, seeing the glory, I mean, because I didn't have anything, but because I had that priority in place. When you are going through some things, it's like you will never get out of it. It's like you will never see the light at the end of the tunnel. It's, that was actually what I was thinking. That is exactly what I was thinking. I was thinking that, oh God, <laughs> let me just survive it. I never knew God would not just make me to survive it. But it would so much elevate me that I would never even dream of having what uh, we got. So today, by the grace of God, in a society that is mostly white, and uh, you know, they used to, the communist government used to support the African countries, so they think the black man is still you know, most countries think like that. I think in America too. But you are there, right? You think it's bad in America? Come to Ukraine. Come to Russia. <laughs> you will know America is a kind of heaven paradise. <laughs> I mean, the ratio kind of relationship, I'm saying. I mean, you have black athletes. You have black politicians. You, you cannot even be a citizen there yet. <laughs> so talk less of teaching anybody anything. So, uh, but in that kind of society, the Lord has given us the grace and he has so much shown for his mercy that uh, it's beyond any doubt. In the, 
just 10 years of our existence, we've built the largest church in the whole of Europe by His grace. Besides that, at least now, I have senators in my church as members of the church, members of parliament. We have millionaires, some of the biggest business tycoons in that city. Uh, you know, people listen to me and to what we need to say. And uh, so it's just beyond what you could imagine. So God is right. When you seek the kingdom first, <laughs> He makes sure, he makes sure that he takes care of the rest. He yeah. takes care of the rest. But I see, and I, I'm going to make a statement now that you are going to find terribly incredible, unbelievable. What I've discovered, I've been coming here for, some, for a few years now to America, and I've speak, work in any church you want, and I've met with people. What I discovered in America is this, that it's the same thing like communism in America. That will really shock you. I told you, you will not believe it. It's unbelievable. Because there is a system. During communism, the system was organized by the government that everybody needs to live this way. And you need to just serve the system. And here also, really, the people also are serving the system. Only the system here, you don't see the government behind it, but you see the culture behind it. The, the, the prosperity culture, the, which is good. We believe in, I'm a prosperity teacher. I'm, I'm pretty sure, but that's not the point I'm making. They, the make it pop culture, the, 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 oh, you know, I speak, I don't speak English in, in Russia, you know, I speak Russian. <laughs> so Russian words are coming to my mind. <laughs> you know, the, the, what do you call this Hollywood mentality, like celebrate, yeah, the celebrity culture. When you are successful, the success culture. That is actually a God right there. Yeah. It is idolatry. Yeah. Just like communism was. And everybody, you know, saw communism, but it was so vivid. But here is subtle. And ev everything, everything, everything is being driven by it. And you don't really see it. So it, it is still that kind of system. Like I saw during communism. For me, it is clear because I lived during communism. So I can say it. people have been driven. In your, in your culture here, people have been driven. Yeah. And you, you cannot, you know, oh, you, people cannot live by the, by the demands of God and by the requirements of the Bible because of the way the whole culture is set up. So you have to be driven like that. You have to strive for success. You have to strive to kind of be successful so, so that people, that is when you are recognized. That is when you are somebody or something. That is when you are, you are a personality. But that is the evil in the system. So you have been driven to make it. But that is not the kingdom. It comes just the opposite, as the opposite of the kingdom of God. So really, people serve the system here also, just like communism. So you serve and you really worship making it, success, achievement. You don't see, but that's what people serve. You serve achievement. You worship achievement. Seek after it. But God said, I want you to seek after me. So we use God now, and the, 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 the most painful part of that is that now what the churches in America have to be careful about, the mistake we are making now is we have now, we have God. Unlike communism, people use the party to be successful. But here we use God. We say, we seek God so that God will make me rich. 
God will make me prosper. God will make me healthy. God will make me healed. God will make me. <laughs> it is still the same thing. Achievement, but through God now. So God is not the goal. It becomes a means. But you can never, you know, believe to God to make him become the means. He's the creator. He's your life. He's the life himself. He's supposed to be the goal. I don't know if you are getting what I'm trying to make. But the whole system is set up in such a way that you can not even escape it. You know, that's just about it. That's why we want to get education. That's why we want to get career. That's why we want to get jobs. That's why we want to get salary. It's your whole thought is you set up in such a way that you, you, you just have to think that's the whole thing you're thinking about. Not as the second thing, matter or secondary stuff, but almost that is the first question everybody t- concerns themselves about. But God, that is the, the, the lesson God taught me in communism. To put the kingdom, to really be a seeker after the kingdom. Put first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek you, me. Seek the kingdom. Seeking him. Then trust him to put you over all other things. But it's not so easy, especially when you are living in such a system. Because, for example, you are made in God's image. You are God's most prized, valued entity. You know, you're anything, you are, the, you are the highest bid of God. But, frankly speaking, <laughs> we have many of you sitting in the church, and until you are really successful, Nobody pays attention to you. To you. Right. But God is saying no. Like for example, I myself, I see it all over. I used to be the same person 10 years ago. But nobody even knew me, even in my own street. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> you are nobody. You are a human being still. Right. In God's eyes, you are the, you are the star already. Yeah. Just being, being a person. Right. Right. Just being an individual. You are already a star. You are already successful. You are already glorified. You carry his image. Mm-hmm. He has made you the, the crown of his whole creation. Right. His glory is already on you just by being a man. Mm-hmm. But we don't treat them like that. No. We don't treat you like that. Until you really become what we want you to be in achievements. Then they begin to treat you as God's creation. (laughs) (laughs) Then they begin to exalt you and really honor you. (laughs) Still because of that same subtle God of materialism, achievements, success... That is really blinding the eyes of people, blindfolding, every, blindfolding everybody's eyes so that we will secretly worship it and put God's standards, God's word, you know, just in the, in the backyard and remember it only when it's fitting for us. <laughs> only when we, you know, it has to, when we like it. So, uh, all these systems, I've come to discover that Jesus was right when he said, the answer for the world is to have the principles of the kingdom. It's not communism, not socialism, not capitalism. All of them as evil as the other one. Because when I spoke about communism, you thought, oh, it's world. Capitalism is just as well. I have come to discover that there is nothing for me to seek on the earth and in this world. That's where I'm getting to. That's where I'm going to. 
Because I've, I, I have discovered there's nothing for me to seek after. Nothing. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. And I will still end up having more than you who seek after everything. <laughs> but I will never put my heart in it. I will never seek after it. I will never be bothered by it. It will never give me sleepless nights. It will never, I will never even spend an extra one minute on the things of this world. And I will still have everything that I need to have more than everybody else. But not, be, and but not because I need it. But because I will need to use it yeah, to, to make a point for him. So every fiber of my body, every, every cell of my being will be totally given up for seeking his purpose, promoting him, and for establishing his kingdom. That is where, that's what I'm created for. So I will exert all my energy, all my strength for that purpose. And the way, God, sometimes God will place you in business to do that. Sometimes God will put you in politics to do that. Sometimes he will put you in education to do that. Sometimes he will put you in the church system to do that. Like I'm in the church system to do that. But you still have to, this, the goal and the purpose remains the same. So when you are making money, then you discover that money is not the goal. So I'm making money because that is the platform God wants to give me. So you have to make as much as possible so that you may be able to pass your message across. So the thing that is bad is not the money or the material things, but your intentions and your motives and your, and your goal and your focus and your being focused on the main thing. What are you seeking for? Are you in that business you're doing? Are you seeking his kingdom there? Are you seeking for his kingdom to overcome the system of that, the worldly system of that business? Are you seeking to promote his kingdom and to put that kingdom principles as the, as the ruling factor? Dominant, dominant factor in that aspect of life. Is that what is driving you? If that is what is driving you, then you are lining up with God. But, so I tell my businessmen, I don't need you to do business and bring me tithes or to the church tithes. You bring tithes to the church, but you think you are doing a big deal to, to, to God or for the church because of that. Forget it. If you are called to, the, to business, you are called to make God reign in that area of life. Like computer business, it means that you, God's name and God's principle in that area, in our, in our society, in the whole aspect of computer business, God wants to become the Lord. That is why you are in that business. Not just to make money and bring tithe to the church. The money is a byproduct. But it's not what you are really there for. But for God to come there to reign first, then the dividends of that is just the money. But that's not what you see. That's not the goal. That's not the reason why you are there. The reason why you are there is that God will reign over that system. The same in politics. The same in, you know, in everything else. So our whole purpose in life is to make God, to bring, to be a God carrier, bring him to be the Lord over that place he has placed us in. So that place he has placed you becomes your own promise line. And you must conquer it. And make God the Lord over the place. So the story of the promise line is about the people of God saved from Egypt, just like we were saved from sin, to go to the promise line. You know, on the way, you have to overcome a lot of obstacles and enemies but you have to. But the final result is to make God the Lord over that land that used to be hidden and a pagan land before. So the same thing in business today, in the oil business, in the computer business, in the medicine business. So that God will be promoted, and He will become the Lord. And not that everybody there will be saved necessarily, but that His system of thinking, His principles, will become a way of life in those structures and in those spheres of life. So, of course, in the process, we make money. In the process, we have housing. In the process, we have influence. But that is not really the thing God is after. What he is really after is that he will be seen. 
Let me tell you something. In the Old Testament, God tried to reveal himself to humanity after, we, you know, we, after the downfall of uh, Adam and, you know, so we lost relationship with God. And God has been trying to restore that and to reveal himself back to people. So he's always been willing to dwell with people, just like he dwelt with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden at the first time. So the attempt, when God gave the Ten Commandments, it was his attempt to come back to dwell in the midst of his people. When he gave, when he, so, but it didn't work. Everybody was going against the commandments. They were not able to keep the commandments. So God changed his style. And he said, build me, first of all, he started with tabernacles in the tents. He said, I will come to dwell among you. So the goal of God has always been to come and dwell with people. But it didn't work out because only the high priest could go to the Holy of Holies and people were still defiling it anyway. So he said, build me temples. They built temples, but it didn't work. So in the New Testament, God's goal is that I will now begin to reveal myself to humanity and to, to through another human being. He said, when they see me dwell in, like in, in, in the flesh like themselves, it will be easier for me to demonstrate myself to another flesh. If for one flesh to reveal and to, demonstrate, to be demonstrated to another flesh is much more easier than through uh, uh, another being. So God became flesh in the person of Jesus. But he did not just reveal himself in the flesh of Jesus. He started a new testament, which, which is the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament, is that in the Old Testament, God was foreign to people and could not we, we seek him. We, but in the, the, the New Testament factor is that in the New Testament, God has come to dwell among people. Emmanuel, God with us now. So that is what separates, that differentiates the New and the Old Testament. So in Jeremiah, Ezekiel, he said, I will make a new heart for you, and my words will be in you. He said, New Testament was promising. So God will dwell in flesh. Then he showed us how that would look like in the flesh of Jesus when God became flesh in Jesus. And we saw that even in the human flesh, people could overcome sin, overcome Satan, and reveal God. And, reveal God. and bring the kingdom. So God, Jesus revealed that to us and went to heaven. But a, a New Testament began right from there. From now on, God will come to dwell in human beings. So for you to be saved, you need to receive God into your heart. So God comes to dwell in the flesh. What is the goal? So that you now will, just, you will do just like Jesus did. Your, you will now be the revealer and the carrier of God in your flesh. You will be revealing God to me, an unbeliever. So how does God look like? How do I find him? I need to find someone who, who knows him, who carries him. So that's the whole purpose of our existence on the earth. So when we live on the earth and strive for survival, to make money, to, we are not living our purposes, the primary purpose. If God just needed to save you, if the reason why Jesus died was just to come and give, take us to heaven or to save us, he would have, his death alone is enough to save us and take us to heaven. But apart from him dying on the cross of Calvary, he has redeemed us. That is redemption. He redeemed us. But then, for us to really get saved, God made continue that which is, he has redeemed us, but you still need to receive him because he needs you to be relevant on the earth. So, you, he has redeemed us, but we, that is, so it is not for salvation that it comes to our heart. He has redeemed us for sure. But he, he needs to come to our heart so that we might begin to reveal him to all the people who have not seen him. So that we might become God's revealers. For example, in John chapter 1 verse 18, 17 and 18, it says, Nobody has seen God before, but the only begotten Son of God has revealed him. He revealed him in the flesh. So God now became flesh. 
And he said, everybody that receives me is saved. In the sense that the kingdom of God comes to you, God comes into you in the flesh. So now God is seeking to be revealed to other people who have not known him in the flesh also. Just like Jesus revealed him in the flesh. But in your own flesh this time. In my own flesh. So my purpose, the purpose, the primary purpose of every Christian is to reveal God in his flesh. In business, in education, in academy, in, uh, you know, in medicine, in music, in entertainment, revealing. If God is in you, your whole idea, your whole life should just be thinking about how can I make it manifest? How can I live in such a way that they will see him in me? How can I do my business and be, do, you know, perform my profession in such a way that it will be transparent? Because Jesus was the revelation of God. And now he, got, he died. If Jesus had been the only one that had been, uh, that had been had in, God had intended to reveal God in the flesh, then it means when he died, nobody else, there is no way to know God again because he died. The only person who is supposed to reveal him in the flesh is dead. And he's no more here. We don't see him again in the flesh. No. He only started it. So that all other people who in whom he has come will now continue his job, continue revealing God to, the, to humanity. Not just by preaching the word, not just by telling the story about Jesus, but by revealing him really. So the, if you read uh, Hebrews chapter 10 verse 5. Of course, you might understand that this is not my message, but Holy Spirit is driving me into this for some reasons or the other. I didn't, I've not even started preaching yet, but I've, the other, I, I just went into it like that. This is not what I, I, I plan to speak about. Verse 5, Hebrews 10, 5. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. Now, that sets you a principle there. In the New Testament, what God needs, unlike the Old Testament, when people served God through sacrifices and offerings, what God needs from man in the New Testament is no more sacrifice, sacrifices, no more offerings. What God needs from man in the New Testament now is only one thing. You know what? Body. 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 I need a flesh and a body through whom I could be revealed. I need a body that will carry me. I am the God that loves humanity. I am the God that created them. But there is no way for me to prove that to them. I have tried to do it through my written word. I gave them my commandments. But if they didn't receive me, they couldn't reveal me. I sent to them my prophets, but they couldn't discover me. I built temples and tabernacles, but they couldn't find me. Now the only thing I could do is to come in their own likeness and to begin to tell them that I am who I am in their own language, in the body that they dwell in. For example, if you see an ant, a little ant, that is, you know, you see, going, and it's going to fall into, is going to, is going to, a, into, into a pit, going to fall into a pit, and ant is very small, and you could not stop him from going, and you could not tell him, you are telling him in your own language, please stop going, you don't go, you will fall into the pit, but, and he cannot understand your language because you're a human being and it's just a small ant, insect. And because you love him so much and you could do anything, you could, the only way to communicate to him is to become an ant and speak the language of the ant to stop him from destruction. That's exactly what God has done. So he's saying the only thing I need from humanity, from you, I have saved you. No problem about it. I died to redeem you. I gave my life for your salvation. 
You have been saved, but I need you. I need you. I need you. I didn't just come to save you. Because if I just come to save you, I could have killed you after saving you and taken you to heaven. Or I could have just, you know, died for you and said, okay, you are now saved. But I never needed to come into your heart. The reason why I need to come into your house is because I need a dwelling place. I need a dwelling place. I need a dwelling place. I need a carrier. I need somebody to carry me. I need somebody to become my carrier and my revealer to other people in their language. Just like that ant will be able to speak to the other ants, they will understand one another. So in the, your own flesh, I want you to personify, to personify me, to make yourself like myself. So, you know, you see me in the scriptures. You see me through Jesus. You see me through the Old Testament. You see my principles, my words. Personal, personify me. Personify me in yourself. Make yourself in my image. I created you in my image. Let your, my character become your character. Let my goals become your goals. Let my purpose become your purpose. And then people will see you automatically. You will become the written gospel. Second Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3. That is what it means. You become the written gospel. That is the whole idea of God. I don't need offering from you. You are trying to please me by bringing me money. I don't need offerings. You are trying to please me by running up and down and say, oh, I'm ministering. I'm doing this. I don't need sacrifices. A body. A body, I say, prepare for me. Prepare a body for me. Give me your body so that I might have my own will in you so that you might yield yourself totally to me so that I could become who I want to become in your own flesh so that this body will say, will obey me. It will go to the market when I say go to the market. It will go to the hospital when I say go to the hospital so that my will will become exactly the only thing that this body will want to fulfill and seek if, you, if, if my own purpose, just yield yourself, yield your flesh, yield your body, so that that body will no longer have its own will, it will no longer have its own goals, but the only goal that that body will have will be my goal. The only will that that body will fulfill will be my will. If you can yield your body to me, I will save the world. Amen. That is the difference. In the Old Testament, for me, that dip, that between the Old Testament and the New Testament, God in the flesh. Where is God? You want to see God? Look at me. I and my father are one. <laughs> yes! That's why I love like he loves. Yeah. That's why I can never get angry at anybody or mad at anybody. No. That is the primary purpose of your creation, to be in his own image. He said, let us fight. Let us create man. Let us create man. That has always been his target. A man that will be in his purpose. I mean, that would be in his image. A man that would be in his likeness. Are you his likeness? So, to fulfill that goal, he had to become spirit again that comes to dwell in you so that you will submit yourself to his image and be totally engulfed by him. Flesh. The, okay, he says about Jesus because he's the first flesh that revealed God. So he said, sacrifice and offering you do, you do, I do not desire, but a body, a body, a body, a body that will fulfill his purpose. Then verse 6 says, in both offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Verse 7, then I said, behold, I have come now. Behold, I have come in the volume of the book written of me to do 
your will, oh God, your body is given to you so that you'll be able to say like that, to do your will, to do your will. This body was given to Jesus in salvation. He said, body, body is the only thing I, know I need. So I gave my body to him so that this body will do only one thing, your will, oh God. Your will, where? According to the volume of the book. That is what it's saying there. The volume of the book. So that it will be, this body will fulfill and live only for one thing. Your will. Live to fulfill the volume that is written of me. That is why he says in 2 Corinthians chapter Verse 20. Okay, let's start from verse 19. That is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. God was where? Can you answer me? Where was God? Where was God? God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not in putting their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now, verse 20. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though, listen to this closely, as though God were pleading through us. As though God himself, God, God is pleading through us. As though God were pleading to us. He needed flesh through whom he could plead. He needed flesh through whom he could operate. He needed flesh through whom he could speak. He needed flesh through whom people could discover him, his character, his heart, and his purposes. And he needed flesh through him who could touch people. God is spirit. But to survive and to minister on the earth, he needed a material body. He needed to touch somebody to say, I love you, my dear. But he doesn't have a hand. So he came to my heart. And what salvation is supposed to be is me retreating my throne, relinquishing my position. And saying, take over my life. Take over this heart. Take over this desire. Take over this will. Take over this hand. I will touch. Let him feel what you want him to feel if you were touching him. I will speak. Let him feel as if, he said, as though we, God, were in us. Speaking, reconciling the world. As God, God was in Christ, reconciling the world. So also now he has made you an ambassador as if, as though God himself in you, reconciling the world to himself. In you, just like God was in Christ, reconciling the world back to him. Now he is in you to do the same thing. That's the purpose of mine in the New Testament. So we do what? We get saved, we get some happiness, and say, oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. We go and do our jobs, and we forgot about our purposes. We don't even, we don't even get to even think about it. Right? That the purpose is still the same. That the kingdom that has come to dwell in me might welcome other people into it. That the goal that is kind 
the God that is loving, the God that is merciful, the God that is great, this God that is incomparable to anything and everywhere, that has come to live in me, will now be seen through me. So I come on television in my country, I say, you, I challenge you atheist. I challenge you communist. I challenge you religious folks. You say, where is God? If you get to me, you will, get to, you will see God. They say, so some people say, he is fanatic, he is crazy, he is cultic, <laughs> occultic. But I know what I'm saying. He's backed up by revelation. A body I needed. So every day, I bow my feet at his feet, and I submit my body to him. Every day, I make him to fill me with his personality and his quality. A body I, want, I need. I don't need sacrifices. What all Christian work is trying to do to God to sacrifice. I sacrifice my time. I come today. Forget it. I don't need offerings. That is Old Testament. What I need is just you, 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 please, you, you, please. But so that you don't tell me, God, what to do. But so that you will be dead. Just you offer your flesh to me. Now, the way I need you. Bring yourself a living sacrifice. Sacrifice yourself to me, yes. Just give yourself to me. Give it up. Give your will. Give, be under my command, my control, and my supervision. I just need a body to work or pray. So how do, I, how do we do that? He said, seek you first. So I seek. Why do we need to seek the kingdom? I needed to know the principles of the kingdom so that I will know how he wishes to operate through me. For example, when they brought the woman with the, the that was caught in uh, adultery, when they brought him to Jesus, you know the story. And Jesus said, he who doesn't have sin, cast this first stone. And he said, go and sin no more. And you know, and release the lady. We all know the stories. But religion has killed God's purpose for man. So we know those stories. I was just, oh, what a kind Jesus. Forget it. That is not what God is trying to teach you from there. Give me your hand. Remove your pen. <laughs> Look, he made you to read that Bible, that scripture, that story, not just for you to tell the story to other people in a beautiful way with your own articulation. People can read that for themselves and get the same story. There are two purposes when we read the Bible. Number one, God is revealing himself to you. But now, he revealed himself through the scriptures in the Old Testament, but now he's revealing himself to you in the flesh of Jesus so that you will know what God does and God's attitude at sinners. Even the worst sinners that are caught, get my mind, get my thought. When I see sinners, I never point fingers. I never accuse. When I see sinners, what I am after is their forgiveness and their deliverance. I'm, I want to forgive them. Then I want to set them free that they will go and sin no more. That is who I am. I never accuse anybody. I never condemn. I nev I'm never mad at sinners in America. You think God is mad at, at you know, the Democrats that are one that won the homo, uh, homosexual thing, marriage, you, you think God is mad at them. Oh, you don't know the will of God. Oh, this anger has got. No, 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 no. It showed, that's why he gave us that, those scriptures. See me. I am looking to forgive them. I'm looking for them to be brought to me. I am looking to set them free. Okay, but that is not the end of this story. On one path, God wants to reveal to you how he thinks, his desires, his will, his, his way of thinking. So that, and he's showing, you to, he's showing to you how he looks like so that you might get him and get to know 
how he wants to be revealed through you. Therefore, when I see God is so kind, it's not blaming, so I discover, ah, this is how he wants to be in me. Through me, he wants to be forgiven just like that. So through me, he wants to set people free just like that and tell them, go and sin no more. So, okay, so I should never condemn. He never condemns, and he's in me. He needs my flesh, he needs my thoughts, he needs my will to express himself. So he wants to express himself through me saying, I will never condemn you, I will never stone you, I never condemn anybody. Ah, then I got it. I will never condemn anybody. I will never accuse anybody. So what God wants to be through me is to show forgiveness, to set free, and to give people chances. Oh, I got it. The purpose of the scripture is not that we tell stories and preach to one another and make Im impressions and, and, and make you jump and fall down and do all that. Forgive us, Jesus. And try to out outdo one another. God wants to discover. He wants us to discover him. He wants us to discover who he is, really. And as we discover him, we are discovering him in ourselves. So there are two questions you must always ask yourself when you read the scriptures. Who is, what does God want? How does God want to reveal himself to me? What, what qualities of his does he want to reveal to me in this passage? Old Testament, New Testament, anyway. What does he want me to tell me of himself? Secondly, where does he want to correct me? How does he want to be in me? Uh, so God wants to be in me or through me like this. A forgiving God. A pardoning God. A second chance God. Okay, I got it. Then when you look at uh, other scriptures, like when Jesus was going about healing the sick, you remember, Jesus, there is no Jesus. Jesus is just God in the flesh of Jesus. If he wants to be the same thing. Jesus, I mean God in my flesh. So Jesus is God in the flesh of Jesus, revealing himself to us. He wants us to get him because it's much more easier for him to reveal himself to us when he's like us, like the end. Yeah. Then just like from papers and from commandments, from words. So he became like us so that we might see his actions through his actions, we see how God behaves. Through his teachings and his words, we see what God thinks. Aha, uh -huh, he wants me to behave like this. His teachings teach me how I am supposed to think, how I am supposed to behave, what I'm supposed to do. So when we see Jesus going about healing the sick, setting free the captives, say, okay, that shows me who I am supposed to be. So God is always seeking to set people free. God is always seeking to heal the sick. Not just the sick, but anybody in need. God is God's problem. So God is always concerned about the needy. And where is God? In my flesh. Okay, then I got it. So I am supposed to be like that. Revealing love, kindness, and relieving humanity of their pains and sorrows. Relieving, re, 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 you know, relieving them and touching them with the love of God and the kindness of God. But what Satan wants is exactly the opposite. He wants you to be concerned about yourself. He wants you to make it first. He wants you to strive for survival. He wants to, you to be engulfed in your own self. He wants you to, you know, just you know, be running about for the things of this world. <laughs> and God said, you were dead, you know. You were supposed to be dead in sin. I, you were lost. I found you. I didn't find you so that your old self that was supposed to have been dead to, to be living for itself again. No, no. I found you. You were dead. Forget about your own life now. When you are dead, I now raise you to live for me. 
It's now my life only in your flesh. If you could think like that and seek for my purpose, all those things that you thought you needed, you will have them automatically. I will con- I'll, it will be my concern. I will supply that. God is looking for people to believe in. So I, I am God addicted. And I feel, yes. So when you are, when you are addicted to something, you don't control it. They, they control you. Alcohol, the desire for alcoholism controls you. The desire, all those things control you. So the same thing, I am God addicted. And I feel that is what everybody's supposed to be. In business, so I am in business to reveal God. To reveal his character, his behavior. I make the money so that people might see who God is and what God will do with money. And how to worship him. I, it gives me a platform or a better voice to reveal God in that particular place he has given me success. So he said you will be the head and not the tail. So that you will be, you, when you are the head, you can speak and the body can listen. When you are first and not the last, you have authority to communicate. But what do we communicate? Not self. Him. So, when I hear people preach on prosperity, I, I am saddened in the sense that people don't know the purpose of prosperity. The way people preach prosperity is that he wants you to feel fine. Forget it. You are dead, you know, you remember. When you got him into your heart, you, you, die, you died. You are, he said in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, you who are dead in trespasses and iniquities. We, you, know, you are dead. Don't, you good? It's not about you again. <laughs> I thought you gave your place to him at salvation. <laughs> so, it's about him. I need, it, I need to have money and be comfortable so that I might reveal him more. So that I might show him the way he looks like. <laughs> And when you don't know the purpose of a thing, you abuse it. So people, and we are not effective in the world. As a church, for 2,000 years, the reason we've not been effective is this. Telling you today. We don't know how to, we don't know God's purpose. We don't know, we don't even know why we're here sometimes. Yeah, some people preach to you as if you are just here to be healed and to be what? Look, most people, if, even who call themselves healing ministers, they don't have half of the healing that I have. And I don't even need to mention it. The reason why God, because people don't know the purpose of blessings. You must know the purpose of blessings, including healing, prosperity, and there is a purpose for those things. And that purpose is not necessarily the way you think. I have seen people, you ask people from our church. Every minister, every service, people minister, people testify, people heal from cancer, people heal from wheelchair. But I've seen people heal of cancer, ra- even people raised from the dead and are not serving the Lord today. In Europe, that's not a big deal, if, especially when you're working with white people, because our churches, you know, you know, our pastor has been here. Our church is 99% white. And for European mind, you know, who are communists before especially, and even Western Europeans, <laughs> okay, God healed me, you know, I got healed. Good for me, you know. Why should I go to, your ch- why should I go to church? Because, of, you know, I'm okay, it's good, you know, it's, it's, it's okay. You know. But you don't really need, don't make a point to them. So you can be healed and not serve God. You can be, but I'm sure you have many people like that. People who got healed or blessed, and they are not in your church any longer. But that is not the purpose of it. It's not about them. But because we don't present it properly. 
and because people are not hooked to the purposes of God, they are actually made for him. I'm not, you are not made for yourself. You are not made to live your life. You don't have a life any longer. And our churches are filled with people who don't even understand this elementary fact. And because of that, we are not effective. There is no way we can change the world if we are not above them, spiritually speaking. If we, our concept of life is the same as theirs. Before you could be able to change something, you must really be superior to it. And I can just imagine the kind of pain Jesus is having to go through again and again when he looks at his church. They missed it. They missed it. They missed it. Oh, yeah, I'm giving them prosperity. Oh, yeah, I'm giving them health, healing. But what about the bottom line? Or they must get the purpose for why I'm doing this. We think it's all about us. But forget it. You are, you are, not, you are supposed to be non-existent. Is supposed to be your life. In him, he said, in him everything was created. Created for him. For him. So the whole reason why I was even created in the first place is for him. Definitely, my life is only supposed to be about him and for him, you know. Created for him, by him, for him. Am I for him? Is he being revealed in my flesh? Am I illuminating him? The thing that made me to get this was communism. And you know why? I never had anybody to teach me. <laughs> you didn't get it. You didn't get it. You didn't get it. <laughs> Because we are mostly taught in the church tradition, you know, what our fathers taught our fathers and our grandfathers. But we need a new paradigm in Christianity. A new paradigm in the 21st century church. I wanted to, after my education in Russia, I wanted to come to uh, America here. There is a renowned uh, charismatic Bible school here that uh, wanted to give me a scholarship to come and study there. And I, when I prayed about it, you would be surprised what God said. He said, no, you are not going. So it's a dream of any man to go there. He said, but you are not going. He said, because there are several ways that I used to prepare my generals. That was 87, that was 17 years ago. What is a general? <laughs> And that was then, you know, it was not a popular terminology then. Then he said, some I take to Bible schools, some I prepare in local churches, in a local church setting, some I, uh, you know, I align with some men of God to be their mentors. But when I want to do something unique, and I don't want it to be diluted, 
and distracted. I take my generals to the wilderness. Moses went to the wilderness. John the Baptist went to the wilderness. And when I want to do something new that is, I don't want it to come to be messed up with. They said, this is your wilderness. Russia and communism. You are already in the Bible school. <laughs> so years later now, when people began to come to the country and many graduates came from that school to, uh, you know, they, they come to live in the Ukraine as missionaries. So they now began to come to our church and they would sit down and say, Pastor, what, what kind of Bible do you read? We've never seen these things before you are talking about. <laughs> so I said, go on, I IQ, I didn't go to that. The point I'm making is we need a fresh breath from God. We need for him to open heaven and give us new thoughts and give us his own purposes and reveal to himself to us afresh. Oh, we need a fresh view, a revelation of God. Not, don't think that what we are doing is automatically correct. 